Thank you. Thanks for having me. Right. Um, I'm, my name is James, and uh, I'm a lead solution architect in uh, GovTech and uh, part of the National Digital Identity Program. So um, a few things uh, before I start, and uh, that is uh, I have to apologize if I'm going to be running a bit fast because um, I'm trying, I, I really have lots to share with you guys, and I'm trying to squeeze what we typically would do in a half day event uh, all in one hour. So uh, bear with me, I'll have a question, a Q&A session at the end of the session, okay? And if you have questions, uh, do feel free to raise them at the end of the session, right? So first of all, uh, let me introduce uh, what is GovTech, yeah. right? GovTech uh, is the implementation agency for the Smart Nation. So as part of uh, the Smart Nation Digital Government Group, okay, we are uh, together with Smart Nation Digital uh, Government Office, SNDGO, we formed that part of the group. And uh, GovTech is the implementation arm, uh, SNDGO is the policy arm, right? So we are serving 5.4 million users across the whole of Singapore, and we operate uh, 600 different digital services, and uh, over, a thousand, uh, over 3,000 ICT systems, okay? and uh, 227,000 right. ICT professionals and uh, across six different centers of excellence. Right. So, today what I'm going to share with you is I'm going to do two things. I'm going to do, uh, first thing is I'm going to share with you what's possible with the National Digital Identity APIs and the large part of it, the first tranche of those APIs are my info and they are, they, there are more to come, right? So I'm going to show you what's possible, what other people have done. Then once you know what's possible, I'm going to share about um, how you can uh, integrate and onboard your applications and quickly develop applications that make use of these APIs. Sounds good? Right? Okay, so... Uh, National Digital Identity. It is the cornerstone of Singapore's Smart Nation Initiative and uh, it is one of the strategic national projects. Okay, and um, it gives, it, we aim to give uh, every user three things. Identity, okay, which is who are you? Okay, authorization, which is do you have the authority to access certain things? And then uh, consent, which is, do you allow me to pass uh, your data, your information to another third party application? Okay. So the Singapore NDI stack is made up of four different layers, right? It's, uh, I will start from the bottom. Uh, first layer at the bottom is the foundational layer, which is the trusted data, right? Next layer is the trusted identity, followed by Trusted access and trusted services. Okay, at the bottom we have my info, and of course we have more to come. So stay tuned for uh, new products that's going to be released under the trusted data layer. Okay, and uh, at the trusted identity layer is uh, our national certification authority, which is currently in the midst of building. Okay, and as you can see, the bottom two layers. It's going to be led by the government and the top two layers are going to be a collaborative effort with the industry, with people like you. Okay, we're going to develop applications, services, okay, that will enable a smarter nation, convenience to all users, all right? Okay, I'm going to play a quick video and uh, to just give you an idea of what is my info if you have not heard about it, okay? Oops. My Info It's a service for all Singaporeans and PRs that prefills forms for you. Anyone with a SingPass account can use this time-saving feature. Your verified data is crafted into your own digital user profile. 
Once you authenticate yourself with SingPass, you can use your digital profile across a wide range of services. Just confirm your data and you're good to go. This means no more same old boring questions and no more repeated document submissions. So here's to life made so much easier. Any service requiring sensitive information, such as your finances, will prompt you for your permission. You can also use my info for private sector services like banking. Rest assured that your data will only be released with your permission. Life is too short to fill up long forms. So take your next, so step, take your next step towards a national, towards national digital, digital, identity digital identity and use, and my, use info my name. All right. Let me just. All right. They say a uh, picture tells a thousand words and a video tells a thousand pictures. So life is too short to fill up long forms. I'm sure all of you agree. If you have filled up, you know, re repetitive forms throughout your life, you'll find that you know my info is the service that will help you to be able to transact faster, easier, and more securely. So my info actually we started this initiative in uh, January of 2016. That's a couple of years back. And when we first started it, we actually rolled it out to all our government services. Right. So we saw very encouraging results from our government services. And we saw like up to 80% reduction in transaction time. Because these forms no longer need to ask you to submit your documents, a photocopy of your NRIC, your passport, you know, a photocopy of your, uh, your tax notice, right? Just to verify when all the data has already been captured by the relevant government agencies. So, we made it available across all our services and we are in the midst of rolling out to all our government digital services. And uh, right now it's available at 121 digital services across uh, government agencies, 40 government agencies. And we're planning to roll that out to 160 by the end of the year. Okay? By the end of uh, this FY. Right? So, having seen so much success within the government, we decided, hey, why not we just, you know, introduce this service to the private sector? So that's what we did in the middle of 2017. And we started a pilot with some banks. We said, Let's take a very simple use case. Let's take an uh, account opening, a bank account opening. So we used to have to go down to the bank, take a queue number, wait for hours sometimes, you know, to wait your turn to get to the counter. And then just to realize that you needed to have, you know, your NRC and you forgot to bring your NRC, right? And they would take photocopies and photocopies of all your documents. And then they will open an account for you. So we wanted to simplify this uh, know your customer KYC uh, process okay, with the banks. And we've seen some very encouraging results. So some banks uh, did tell us that of all the eligible um, users who have MyInfo accounts, right, half of them choose to use MyInfo to transact. Okay, and out of those that use MyInfo, we see 80%, up to 80% reduction in the application time, right? And then up to 15% uh, approval, increase in approval rates for the applications, right? Because the data is of a better quality, there's no, uh, there's nowhere where you can have manual human error when you're, you know, validating forms because you're not validating and verifying manual forms anymore, right? So let's take a look at an example. Right, so this is one of the services we have. You are familiar with it, that's good. I hope you, it's familiar with you. So if you go to a DBS today and you try to apply for a multiplier uh, account, let's say, okay, you are one of the very low minority of people in Singapore that do not have a relationship with DBS or POSB. You don't have an account there. So what you do is you apply for a bank account and step two, you say, I want to retrieve my info. 
to apply for a bank account. Right? Once you say, I want to retrieve my info, uh, you will be prompted with a SingPass login. And after successful SingPass login, we will ask you for a consent saying that Google Services is asking you whether do you allow them to access these data sets in your MyInfo profile. And when you say yes, I agree. Okay. The data is transmitted directly to the DBS servers from my info and application is complete. You just need to verify your information and submit. Okay, and that's it. No additional form filling, no additional data uh, or document that you need to upload. Okay, and that's it in a matter of minutes. This same know your customer process has been already integrated with many banks and financial institutions across the financial in the industry and you know some other industries as well okay so you have that today um, if you haven't seen one go look for them right we also had um, some encouraging responses feedback from uh, UOB they said um, recently in uh, July of this year they rolled out a 15 minute car loan application process so the idea is that you can go down to the car showroom and say I want to buy this car right then you start the application process take the car out for a test drive and when you come back from the test drive you can drive the car home right so that is what they actually rolled out and they say that because of my info, they have up to 15% increase in approval rate from the bank loan, right, for the car. Next, we have OCBC. OCBC rolled out in June an instant bank account opening. So the idea is that you apply for a bank account with OCBC digitally using my info. At the end of that five minute, three minute process, okay, you will get a bank account number and you can use that bank account number to transact immediately, right? And so they say 50%, half of the people who have my info choose to use my info to apply for a bank account. Some other statistics from OCBC, from the first half of the year, Okay, two, the third quarter of this year, they actually saw a three times increase in digital bank account opening. And out of those, this, this pie right, right here, 90% of them choose to use my info. Okay, and as a result of the, uh, the there's no need for them to verify the manual document, sub, document submissions they see a 20% operational efficiency improvement. All right? So that's quite a lot of money if you have ever been in the banking sector. All right, so if your application is not part of the MyInfo ecosystem, we encourage you to come and join us. All right, join the growing ecosystem. So you might see some familiar icons up there. So these are um, services, uh, organizations that already have services integrated with my info today. Right, so how do you get involved? Okay, uh, there is a QR code here, you can scan it, and this is actually our newly revamped National Digital Identity API portal. So it's a portal that's built for developers like you and partners, business partners. So what you can do as a developer, you have open access no need for a login, no need to apply for account. You can just access the, our sandbox APIs, try out the code, look at our sample source code. Later, I will you know, give you a, a, a tour of the source code. And all our technical documentation is all up there for you to uh, see. So that what we want to do is to get you guys to be enabled, give you the tools that you need to quickly build your app. So for partners, if you want to take that amazing app that your 
developer has just built and you want to take it to production. Right? All you need to do is to log in with CodePass on the bottom, apply for a link up request, and we will get you started on the onboarding journey. Right? It's pretty simple. Okay. So the portal looks like this. Okay. If you uh, have not gone, do check it out. And uh, there are a lot of APIs up there, um, which are still, we are still in the midst of baking, right? Uh, but the mature ones that are ready for integration are, is my info. Okay, so we have a vibrant community of developers and partners. Just some numbers. We have 3.3 million eligible profiles. That means 3.3 million SingPass users in Singapore who have a MyInfo account automatically provisioned to them already. Okay, so they can start using your services immediately. We have 200, more than 260 digital services across government and commercial sector, right, that is already linked up with MyInfo. Okay, we have more than 50 data items that's verified by the government, okay, which ensures your data quality. And we have thousands of developers and partners who have visited our site. Uh, if you look to the right-hand side where we have a chart, just to give you an idea of the exponential growth of MyInfo, in 2016, when we first started, we had about 30,000 transactions the entire year. The next year, we had a little bit better. We had like 110,000 transactions in 2017. And that's the year that we started doing a pilot with the banks. So what happened from 2017 to 2018 is we decided that the benefits were so great that we provisioned all SingPass users with a MyInfo account so that everybody can transact. So then you see the transaction numbers jump. So this is not a year yet. In nine months, we have hit 6.6 .6 million transactions, 6.6 .6 million instances of people who have transacted with MyInfo to do something digitally, right? Across government and commercial sector. And the latest number as of right now is 8.3 million, right? So we're seeing exponential growth. And 2019 is gonna be even greater because we are onboarding even more digital services, right? So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the scale that we're working at. And these are all powered by our APIs, which later I will show you. Okay, so what's next in 2019? So the vision for us today, we have what is on the left side, personal data. Personal data, individuals can transact digitally with verified data from the government. In 2019, this is what our goal is, to empower the businesses, okay? So they can enjoy the same level of flexibility, convenience, all right? and security that the individuals already have today. So if, it's, if it has ever a better time to get on board, now is the time. Okay, so subscribe to our mailing list, which is on the NDI API portal for new features, new data items, and new updates on when this is coming. Okay, so now, what are the possibilities? What's possible with your app today? How can you use my info to add value to your application, to your product, and remove the friction for users to access your applications? What other data sets do you need that we don't have today? Okay, you can talk to us, right? Because we're always expanding our uh, data items and for partners what new, new services do you want to build that's not existing but you want to build something new because of the possibilities that my info has created for you okay so some food for thought so now that I have shown you what is possible hope I save your time yes I hope yes right I'm gonna talk about 
how you can build your application to link up with my info, right? And it's actually pretty simple. First, let's understand the my info data, the data format, okay? If you go to the NDI API portal and you go to trusted data, and under trusted data, you click my info, you will see our API library. This is the entire API library for my info. So it gives you a little bit of introduction, uh, tell you about our data, give you the guidelines and the implementation guidelines that you need to, to adhere to when you develop your application. Some online tutorials, which later I will go through, and other resources and uh, our API specifications. All here. So everything you need to build your prototype app is here. Okay? So, if you go to the API specifications, right, you will see this is our API specs. Sorry, a little bit cut off, right? But we are now at version 2.1.1 and it's uh, constantly evolving. You see the rate of change for our version. So we're adding new data items, right, every few months. Okay? Right. In the API specifications, you will see sample responses, sample code, right, the code command that you need to use to fetch the data. Right? And then we have a detailed, very, very detailed explanation of every single data item we have available in my info. So, let me just walk through very quickly. So each data item, for example, like the name, you have the value of the name. Okay, simple enough to understand. You have the data classification. Right now, because our data is all personal data, it's classified as confidential, subject to PPA. Right, next, source. This is very important. So this flag, or rather this value tells you where the data is coming from. So if the value is one, it is coming from a government verified source. So that means if, for example, it's your uh, tax uh, document, right? So this means that the tax uh, numbers are actually coming from the verified government source. So what this also means is that if you receive a data field from my info, that is government verified, you must make it non-editable on your digital service form. Because if I already verified it for you and you allow the user to change, then it's not verified anymore, right? There is a rigorous verification process that each data source agency does to make sure the data quality is there, okay? So that's very important. If it's two, it's user provided. It means that we are capturing some fields, not a lot, um, that we feel that the user can provide. For example, they want to provide an alternative mailing or billing address. We allow that. But we want to tell you that this field, we are not verifying. Our agencies are not verifying. Right? You have to do your necessary verification if your business requirements requires it. Okay? Third. There are some fields that are not applicable to that person. The data field that you requested is not applicable to the person transacting with you. You will see a flag, three, okay, not applicable. Okay, which means that um, it's not applicable, right? It's a very different value from now or blank, okay? The last value is a little bit special we have a category of uh, data items that are verified by SingPass as a result of the SingPass onboarding process. So these are, these are fields like uh, email address, mobile number, right? So sometimes the email address and mobile number, because it's verified by SingPass, but it's not verified by a government agency. The difference is this. The difference is if it's verified by SingPass, it means that we are verifying it using an OTP, a one-time password, right? So we can tell you for certainty that this email address or this mobile number exists. Okay, it's there. 
okay somebody is at the end of that email or that mobile numbers because they have actually verified the one-time password with us but we cannot tell you whether this mobile number or email address belongs to this person okay so that's a very big difference government verified means that this field belongs to that person okay so that's a subtle difference next last updated last updated means the last time this data field was updated from the data source right so we typically update our data uh, regularly uh, every working day right so the latest you will see a, a gap in the data the longest gap will probably be one working day unless there's some exceptional situations but this field allows you to see you know when was the data last updated okay so that you can know when to retrieve the data again yes please hi um you don't split the name into the surname and the first name that is very good question okay uh, the answer is the short answer is no and the reason is because today ICA does not split your name into first name and last name and middle name right so the data is as captured by the government agency the data source right so unfortunately uh, the way that they captured data you know is one name okay of course there are compound names in um, in ICA they actually have different types of names they have your primary name your alias name your ethnic name and all those uh, they are available in my info as well right it's just that the data agency the data source agency did not split the name into first last name okay so that's the reason why good question though okay some data fields are actually code values so you will see a code right something like that and Okay, it doesn't mean one to one. It means this guy stays in a detached house. Okay, so uh, the API specs provide you with the detail to let you know what to expect when you're building your application. Okay. So, what are the key highlights? Personal data, uh, the, the data format for our my info person data, uh, you, it's, it's kind of like this. It's a very simple to read JSON format. Okay, each data field has some compound values to tell you uh, it's like a metadata of the, the actual data item, including the actual data. And uh, please familiarize yourself with the data formats and uh, they are all available on our API specs. Okay, there's no login, no registration required. Just go and take a look. Okay, also note the guidelines for using government verified data and refer to the specs on the portal for detailed explanation on every single data item. Okay. I have some time to take questions before I go, go into OAuth. Any questions? Feel free. Yes. Data on credit assessment, credit rating. Um, that is coming soon. Okay. Um, I don't have a confirmed date yet, but uh, again, stay tuned on the portal, subscribe to our mailing list, and uh, once new data items are out, usually within the next few days when the data items are available, we will you know, send an email uh, to everyone on our mailing list. All right? Yes? Sorry? What are the some? Um, okay, right. Yes, short answer is it depends on your uh, business requirements. Because, uh, for example, we work with the banks, and the banks have a very stringent KYC process, right? They need to check certain things, okay? And those guidelines are being set by uh, MAS. So, again, depending on the industry, uh, the requirements that you have, uh, you check whether the fields are available in my info, and then you use that to do your own KYC, right? 
Any other questions before I move on? This is the heavy part. Okay, let's go. All right. My info uses O of. O of 2, to be specific. And what is O of 2? O of 2 is an authorization framework. And to put it very simply, it defines three different roles. It's a typical three legged O of. It defines the resource owner, which is the user, the client, which is your application, and finally, the resource server. In our case, it's my info. Right? So basically, it allows the application to request the resource owner for permission to access the resource that the user uh, has, the user has ownership of. Right? So my info, um, if you, can I get a show of hands who have knows O of, right? Oh, quite a fair bit of you. That's good. All right. So if, for those of you who know O of, you know that O of has so many flows, so many different impl implementations, so many different interpretations, and RSCs built on RSCs built on RSCs. Okay, so I'll be more specific here. We are using the authorization code grant flow. And uh, the reason why will become apparent later. Okay? And we also use the API gateway as a facade for all the APIs. So we facade everything through an API gateway. So you don't have to call the resource server directly or the authorization server directly. Just call our API gateway and we'll take care of the rest. Okay? One party to call. Uh, between our authorization server, which we call consent platform, and SyncPass, which is the identity provider, we use OpenID Connect to do the um, identity uh, author authentication federation. Okay? Of course, there's a lot of other black magic that happens at the back end, right? Which is why I will not review. Okay, let's take a look at the OAuth uh, authorization code grant abstract flow. Very simplified, okay? Too simple for some of you who already know OAuth, but indulge me. Okay, so typically uh, in this flow, an application will request authorization from the resource owner. The resource owner, having established his identity, will return with an authorization grant, or usually authorization code. Using the grant, the application will then ask the authorization server for a access token. The access token, once received by the application, can then be used to request for a resource that the user has ownership of and given permission. The protected resource will be returned back to the client. Simple, right? Very simple. Okay, and we implement that using three different APIs. Authorize, token, and the resource API, which we call person. Okay? Uh, if I lose any of you here, feel free to stop me, right? Because, yeah, we are jumping in really into the deep end. So, let's talk about Authorize API. What happens in the Authorize API? Right? Let's say you are building a bank application for credit card application. So, on the browser, your user will say, I want to apply for the credit card using my info. So what you do is you call our authorized API on our API gateway. Okay. Our API gateway will re do a 302 redirect through the browser to the sync pass for the person to log in. Sync pass. Okay. Simple. When the user has completed the sync pass login process and successful, okay, we will redirect him to our consent platform. Right? Consent platform will say, oh, good, you have uh, logged in successfully. Then I will show the user, okay, do you give permission to allow this application to access your MyInfo data? So this is the consent page, right? So then the user says, I agree. Consent platform captures that consent and then does a redirect to your application via the browser with a very short lift of code. 
Okay, very short lived of code. Okay. So using the off code that you received from the the next step is you call make you make a server to server call using the off code to our token API hosted on our API gateway, right? So what we'll do is we'll validate. Are you correct? Are you who you say you are? Are you the correct application? And then we will forward the call to Consent Platform. Consent Platform will say, yes, this awkward reflects somebody who has just logged in. So I'm going to generate a access token in a JWT format. And then it comes back to you. Okay, so now you have the access token, right? Step three. Person API. So now that you have the access token, okay, you verify the signature of the access token because the token is actually signed by us to prevent any tampering. So if you validate the signature of the token is okay, it means that the token has not been tampered with. Once you verify the signature, inside the access token, you will get the identity of the person who just logged in, the ID, e either the NRIC or um, the FIN number, right? So using this FIN number or NRIC, the person ID, as well as the access token in the bearer of your request, what you do is you call our person API, again, facaded by our API gateway, okay? What we'll do is, um, is it the correct person that you're calling for? Uh, is the access token that you presented to us valid? Okay. And is the permission valid and uh, aligned with what you are requesting for? So if all checks out, we'll forward the call back to our resource server, which will do another similar verification. And if everything checks out, we will return the person data back to you. Okay. And that is all of questions. Yes. Uh, so the verify signature is that an API from your side or how the customer will do it? How the application will do it? Yes, your application can do that. There are very uh, there are quite a lot of open libraries that you can use to uh, val validate the token the signature. Right. So it's like an asymmetric key? Yes, correct. Yeah. So we will give you the public key. Okay, okay. Then you very validate the signature using our public key. Okay? Cool. One more question. Yep. Uh, the data you are passing in the access token in the JWT form. So is that in plain text or tokenized? It is um, neither. Okay, and I'll explain later. Right, it's neither plain text nor tokenized. Right, I'll explain later. Okay, I understand what you mean. Yeah, there's no token introspection. Okay, if you but it's not also not in plain text. Okay, so let's go on to uh, a little bit deeper. After we've implemented OAuth, we need to secure them. We need to secure the APIs because evidently, as you know, my friend here has you know, raised some questions, we all know, those of you who know OAuth 2, you know that OAuth 2 is not secure inherently. Okay, by itself, it's not secure. But there are things that we can do to secure it. Okay, so of course, mindful, because we're dealing with all of our data, you know, our income, our very private data, we take security very, very seriously, right? So that's why we need to secure this whole process. And OAuth by itself is not secure, but we need to enhance it to prevent a man in the middle attack. Okay, and here's where I will explain um, the man in the middle attack. A typical scenario, not every scene. I won't be able to go through all scenarios, but just typical scenario, okay? So in uh, OAuth typical fashion, okay, I'm going to go through this quickly. You call the authorized API, authorization server redirects through the browser to give you the off code, and you use the off code to present to the authorization server for a token, access token, you get the access token back. Using the access token, you call the resource server, get the data. Simple, right? But there's a problem, because a man in the middle attack can happen so this is how it will happen, right? One of the ways. 
So when you're doing the authorize and login and all stuff, but what happens if you are sitting in a, you know, like a web cafe, and somebody is spoofing a Wi-Fi hotspot, and you don't know what it is because they say free Wi-Fi, so you just log on, right? So by doing that, they inspect every single packet going through them, which you access. So during this time, when the authorization server is returning you the auth code, this guy who's acting as a hotspot steals the auth code and immediately calls the authorization server and say, hey, it's me. Please give me the access token. Right? The, then the authorization server, of course, I don't know anything because I gave you the auth code, right? So the authorization server say, okay, I'll give you the token. And now this guy, this red guy has uh, your access token and he can do anything he wants with it. So what he does, of course, he steal your data, right? So that's a typical scenario of a man in the middle attack. So how do we secure this? How do we make it uh, such that you cannot do this? You cannot attack it in the middle. Okay, so um, at GovTech, we spend a lot of time thinking about security and consulting with various different divisions within the government to come up with a solution for this. Uh, it's actually pretty, pretty simple. Okay, so we secure two things. First, we secure the request, then we secure the response. So what we do to secure the request is the request are secured using PKI digital signature asymmetric key for two-way mutual authentication at layer 7 okay right so back to this dangerous scenario okay so what we do is before we even allow the application to call us we say hey let's do a key exchange and that is what NDI API portal is for Let's do a key exchange. You give me your public key, I give you my public key. You can verify who I am, I can verify who you are. Right? So now, with the key exchange, it means that only this application who uses his private key to sign the request will be recognized by me. If you're not using the correct signature, I will reject you. So this means that this guy, even if he steals that off code, is useless to him because he can't call because he doesn't have your private key again. Private key is supposed to be private. Okay, very deep, very, very deep, right? But it's so important that you do not put your private key in your client application because that's not secure. You keep it in the server side where you have your firewalls, you have your edge defenses, right? And if somebody steals your key, you do a key rotation, right? So you have a lot more control there, right? So now, without the correct private key, he cannot call the resource server as well. So rejected, rejected. But the application that was on board, we can verify that, hey, you are who you are, layer seven, mutual two-way authentication okay and we say yes you are who you are i will return to you the token likewise application calling the resource server we will say oh you are who you say you are i will give you back the data okay so this is how we secure the request by knowing exactly who we trust knowing exactly which application to trust because I'm not sure if you have seen the uh, Facebook Stripe Google implementation. I'm not saying they're not good, but they just don't have as much to lose, you know, your income statements and all that. So they don't use this method because it's very heavy, it's very intensive. You have to do a lot of stuff, right? right? And you cannot trust everybody. And inherently, that is the you either trust everybody and you get hacked or you trust choose who you trust and you secure yourself right so that's the 
paradigm and the balance uh, of security versus convenience that many people who implement OAuth uh, struggle with. Okay. Now, a little bit deeper, how do we sign the request? Again, you can, there are many implementations out there that tell you, you sign the request, sign the request. But if you don't sign the request properly, you actually are still vulnerable of getting hacked. So I'll explain. First of all, you have your request with the header and the parameters. Okay, you use a set of token parameters that we have defined upfront. Okay, these are required by our API gateway. Then you construct a base string. Okay, using the header, the parameters, and the authorization token parameters. So this base string is a representation of your entire request, along with some randomized non. Okay, so this is a representation of the entire request. Then what you do is you use your private key, you sign on the base string. So you don't sign on the header or the parameters, you sign on the base string, which represents your entire request. Okay, this is to prevent somebody from tampering your request. They can intercept you, change your parameters, and send the message to us. And if you didn't sign on the whole representation of the request, the re recipient will think that you're okay, right? So now you have the digital signature. Okay, you create the authorization header. Many of us will be very familiar with the authorization and uh, put this signature in the header. And this is the request that you send to us, okay? So very simple, A, B, C, D, token, uh, token parameters, base string, sign to get the digital signature and put it in the authorization header. Okay. Okay. Right. I hope I haven't lost anyone yet. Okay. Bear with me. Okay. We are just getting deeper and deeper. Okay. Next, securing the response. So securing the response. Why, why do we want to secure the response even though we already established two-way mutual authentication. We have HTTPS, channel encryption. Isn't everything secure when we encrypt everything in HTTPS? Is it? Not really. Okay. Right. So um, we secure the response further by encrypting the payload that we send back to you. Right. So when we send the payload back to you, we encrypt it using JSON web encryption. Okay. And this is encrypted using your public key so that only you with your private key can decrypt it. Okay. And this ensures that even if the payload is intercepted midstream by some unknown factor, they won't be able to make sense of it. It will be all gibberish to them. Okay. Right. So, how do you decrypt? our encrypted response. Wow, it's getting very difficult to integrate with my info. I wish I've never come, right? No, actually it's pretty simple, okay? So the header, uh, JWE Compact Serialization Format, which is, the, which is the format that we use, uh, consists of five parts, okay, separated by dots. So first part is the header, which tells you what algorithms we use, okay? Next is the encrypted key, which is actually the key to decrypt the payload, the content encryption key. Okay, I'll explain a little bit more later, but we encrypt it. Okay, using, we encrypt this key using your public key. Okay. Next, we have the initialization vector, which is a secure random value. And then we have the ciphertext, which is the actual payload that is encrypted. Lastly, we have the tag, which is to ensure the integrity of the whole format. Okay. So now, how do you decrypt this colorful format? First, using the header to know what other algorithms, you take the encrypt, encrypted key, content key, take your private key, and run the decryption. After the decryption, you will get a content 
encryption key. Okay, so take note, your private key is asymmetric, the content encryption key is symmetric. Okay, and symmetric key, this key is generated every single time we encrypt a payload, it's never reused. Okay, so then you take the ciphertext, take the decrypted content encryption key, and the initialization vector and the tag run the decryption algorithm based on what is defined in the header and you get your payload and you will see Tan Xiaohui again okay anyone else? questions so far? yes No, difference. This is a this key is re, is generated every time. This is your private key. So this is the same. Yes. Yes. It's the same key that you use to sign the request. Okay, to generate your digital signature to come to me, right? So I use that same key pair, the public key, to encrypt this guy and send it back to you. So you only you have the right okay so uh for the sake of those who are not uh crypto experts here uh simplified version is the content encryption key is symmetric because it performs better also it allows for encryption of a larger payload okay it's fast but it's not very secure okay the asymmetric key is used to protect this small payload which is a very small key okay and because it is more secure but is less efficient slower and can only encrypt up to the, the byte length of the key okay right time for demo okay um, I hope I have not lost all of you okay I still have a little bit of time for demo Okay, so if you go on our website, our portal, and if you go to tutorial, okay. oh, I'm not connected, sorry. <laughs> Forgot to connect my internet connection. Yeah, there is. Yeah, just give me a minute while I can, yeah, one of my friends help me. We have a Wi-Fi hotspot. Give me a phone. Hmm? Yeah, or something. This one? If we work? We work, yes. Yeah, let's try. Yeah, okay. Looks good, looks good. Yeah, let me try again. Okay, we're back in business. Okay, if you go to the portal and you go to the tutorial, tutorial 2 specifically, you'll see that there is a sample application from GitHub, which I have already opened up here. We download the sample application. Okay, this is what you will get. Right here, sorry. Okay, so for simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna quickly go through. Okay, and uh, I have downloaded the sample application already. Uh, it's in my it's in my workspace, and what I do is I'm just gonna start it because I've done all the installation. Okay, then we started this demo app. So it's, a, it's an app that we built in Node.js, okay? And it kind of gives you a flavor of what you can do uh, with your app and you can use it as a base to get yourself started or you can, you know, do your own stuff. Right, so once I started the app, okay, I just go...
Okay, so I have my app up. So this is the MyInfos demo application. All right, so you have, remember the three APIs, the authorized token and person API. So here, when you click on this button, uh, what we're doing at the back, what we are doing at the back end is to call the authorized API. So when we do that, you'll be directed to SyncPass. See, right? All right, okay, thanks. Okay, so SyncPass, uh, so you, all you need to do is log in. Of course now, if you have SyncPass Mobile, if you have not downloaded SyncPass Mobile, uh, go download it from the Apple App Store or the uh, Play Store, right? It's really convenient. Okay, so because this is a staging and test environment, so there's no need for 2 fa and all the stuff, right? So once we finish the login, it does the callback, and you can see this is a consent page. This application is asking you permission to give your data. So when I click I agree, okay, it comes back. And then on the back end, I'm actually doing a lot of stuff. I'm doing the token call, getting the access token, and then using the access token, I'm calling my info again to get the data and matter of seconds, comes back, boom. Right. So it's that simple. Okay, and there's sample code available. You can take it, use it, okay, build on it, or build your own. Okay, questions at this point? Must be too simple. I need to come up with more difficult material. All right, very simple, very short demo over. Okay, right, so congratulations, you have learned how to integrate your application with my info. Very simple. So tomorrow I'll see 20 new application. Right. Okay. Right. What if you want to try? Okay. We do have our tutorials online. Okay. I've shown you where is it. Okay. Go check it out. No login required. No registration required. Just go and have a look. Okay. Some references. So we use uh, JWE. Uh, yeah, since everyone likes RSCs or on RSCs, so I thought I'd just leave it here. We have some tools to help you check your base string, whether it's correct, help you check your signature, whether it's correct, and then expected format if you run into any problems. Because that's, in, in our experience, that's where most uh, developers have problem with. So we actually built some tools to help you verify them. Okay? Right, Q&A. Questions? This is uh, going to be, um, after this will be the end of my session. Any questions? Yes? Do you have any NPM packages? We do not have any NPM packages. Uh, what we do have is the GitHub. Yeah, so you can just clone it. Yeah. All good? Yes? Uh, you saying. Right. Let me just go go here. If you go to our portal and you click my info API data, so this actually gives you the full data catalog that's available. Every single data item. So one call Yes, one call you can get whatever you need. Yeah. Because just now I showed you, right? You know, I'm accessing so many. It wouldn't happen so fast if I'm calling every single time for each data item. Yep. Yes, of course. Right. So uh, all the data items are here. The where is it coming from? Whether mm -hmm. is it government verified? And all the different and we update it constantly. Okay. Uh, base string checker is here. If you need, so we have different parameters that you key in, just to check that your code is doing the right thing. Okay. Same thing with the signature verifier. Okay. Yeah, resources available to you. So with it, oh. yes. Thanks. Yeah, I think I spoke too long for the battery. It's giving me a hint that I need to quickly wrap up my session. All right. So, um, you have all the tools available to you. 
okay, in the API library over here. So do check it out and uh, um, keep an eye out for new APIs that are going to be released in the upcoming uh, year or two. Okay, there will be national digital identity APIs to allow you to do various different things. Okay, and uh, as and when we get the information, we will communicate them out to our mailing list. So do remember to sign up for our mailing list. All right. Any last questions? Yes. So for information like uh, CPI, that, what sort of checks do we need to go through on our end to access them? Or is it really okay? Okay, there is a, an approval process. If you want to take your application from just a prototype to production. So earlier I mentioned that you use uh, the same portal, but you log in using uh, Copass. You need to get a Copass account that's representative of a company. And once you log in, there's another uh, UI allowing you to do a link up request. You say, hey, I want to use my application to link up with my info. Here's what my screenshots look like of my prototype. Please approve me because I need this to do what we ask for all your justifications there. And then uh, when, once our people has reviewed them, approved them, then we will bring you on board and you can start applying. Okay? Yes? My question was from the very beginning when you talked about who you had created accounts for in my info. Mm -hmm. You said initially that it was for, um, for citizens and PRs, but then you also said it was for anybody with a SYNC pass. Uh -huh. So is it for everybody with a SYNC pass or just PRs? So uh, we provision that to everybody with a SYNC pass, but there are some exceptions. So um, uh, SYNC pass has some very special accounts that are you know, used uh, for uh, certain tax purposes of individuals that are not Singaporeans or not citizens uh, and not even a, a for recognized foreigner within Singapore. So those are not included. But majority of those are. Yeah. So if, you, if your application encounters somebody that is not eligible, we will return you, the API will return you 404 error, right? And then you handle it gracefully on your end. Yeah. Last question? All right, yes? So I was playing more with this uh, NDI app. So there's one more application flow where a user can download the application and register and can download an app in the mobile phone and can do a login where it sends a pop in message in uh, the application. Okay, that is, you're referring to the SingPass mobile app. Yeah, that's a different app. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure about that, but I think uh, I paste some blockers in that. So, what the other redirection is not happening. So, I register uh, my app with the redirect URI. Mm -hmm. I get 200 or 302, but the redirection doesn't happen. Ah. So, can I get any support on that? Sure, we actually do have um, support contacts available if you go to the API library. Right here. Sorry. Thank you. Right. Yep. Over here. So I'm already touched with them. Yep. So uh, as for them, the mobile application that they're hosting should mm. be a global URL. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm working for OCC Bank. Ah, a friend. Welcome. Yeah. So we don't have an exposed uh, URL or an app for POC purposes. All right. So what we have is in house. Okay. Or uh, let's say the web flow also. So when I just give my uh, username, NDI username. Okay, sorry to cut you off, but since you're a friend, we can talk later over drinks, right? Not right. It seems a little bit more complex and in depth. So I I don't want to hold up the other people who want to go and have their dinner or something, right? So uh, thank you so much for having me, and I hope to see your application as part of our community very very soon. Thank you.